Good morning. This hearing is called to order. 45 percent of the world's oil is located in Iraq, Iran, and Saudi Arabia, and almost two-thirds of known oil reserves are in the Middle East. Events in that part of the world have a dramatic impact on oil prices and on our national security. In the late 1970s, the oil embargo, Iranian Revolution, and Iran-Iraq War sent the price of oil skyrocketing. Yesterday, oil surged to a new record of $97 a barrel amid government predictions of tightening domestic inventories, bombings in Afghanistan, and an attack on a Yemeni pipeline that took 155,000 barrels of oil off the markets. And with Al Qaeda threatening to attack Saudi Arabian oil with our continuing struggles in Iraq and with yesterday's announcement that Iran now has 3,000 operating centrifuges for enriching uranium, each day carries with it the possibility of major oil supply disruptions leading to economic recession and political or military unrest. The United States currently imports more than 60 percent of its oil. Oil has gone up more than $70 a barrel in the last six years, from $26 a barrel in 2001. Each minute, the United States sends $500,000 abroad to pay for foreign oil imports. That's $30 million per hour, $5 billion per week. This analysis only considers oil prices through August. With the record prices of late, these figures will surely grow by year's end. Much of these funds end up in the pockets of Arab princes and potentates who then funnel the money to Al Qaeda, Hezbollah, Hamas, and other terrorist groups. With that kind of money at stake, it is no coincidence that we have 165,000 young men and women in Iraq right now, and it is no surprise that much of our foreign policy capital also happens to be spent in the Middle East. Our energy policy has compromised our economic freedom and the American people want action because they know that the price has become much too high. Last week, a group of energy and military experts converged in Washington to conduct an energy security war game. But the truth is the scenario that unfolded uh, didn't really seem at all fictitious. Like today, the scenario began when oil prices had gone up to trade consistently in the $95 per barrel range. Like yesterday's attack on a Yemeni pipeline, the first event leading to crisis involved an attack on the ba Baku pipeline. And also, like today, Iran's nuclear ambitions and U.S. efforts to contain them proved to be co a complicated endeavor that requires us to maximize all of our diplomatic, military, and economic leverage. The problem is, with oil, we have almost no leverage. The United States is home to less than 3 percent of the world's oil reserves. Uh, Sixty percent of the oil that we use each day comes from overseas. Global oil production levels uh, are at about 85 million barrels per day, with excess production capacity at only about 1.65 million barrels per day. Hurricane Katrina alone removed as much as 1.4 million barrels per day from supplies. The Strategic Petroleum Reserve has just over a month's worth of oil in it. The reality is that there are no good short-term options to help us deal with oil addiction. We have, however, at the same time, a, a piece of legislation which is uh, now pending between the House and the Senate, which has the potential to raise the fuel economy standard to 35 miles uh, per gallon, uh, would uh, uh, would have 15 percent of our electricity uh, produced from, uh, from renewable electricity uh, sources, uh, and it would also use cellulosic uh, fuels to substitute for oil, which we could import. That bill uh, should be uh, finished if we can work hard on it between the House and the Senate uh, over the next four weeks. I look forward uh, to learning more about shock, uh, oil shockwave from our witnesses, as well as their views about what Congress can do uh, to address our energy security uh, challenges. Uh, I now turn to recognize the ranking member uh, of the Select Committee, the gentleman from Wisconsin, 
Mr. Sensenbrenner. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Everyone who stops to fill up at the pump, and that's most people in this country, know firsthand how the United States' dependence on foreign oil affects them. They feel it in their wallet, pennies at a time, as the price of gas creeps up. And most Americans understand that the price of oil is often influenced by events around the world. I doubt the results of the oil shockwave simulations would surprise many Americans. But I bet many Americans don't realize just how vast the energy supplies are in the United States. Beneath this great nation, there are enough energy reserves to propel us towards energy security. And surely we have the intellectual and scientific capacity to give us energy security that all of us, Democrats and Republicans, desire. According to the Interior Department, there are potentially 102 billion, that's with a B, barrels of untapped oil in the United States, including offshore reserves in Alaska, the Pacific, and Gulf of Mexico. Add to that the potential of 635 trillion, with a T, cubic feet of natural gas remains untapped, and we've got what we need to start weaning ourselves off the oil supplies from foreign countries that are hostile to the United States. But that's just the start. It's estimated that there are 250 billion tons of recoverable coal reserves, which is nearly six times the combined U.S. oil and natural gas reserves. In fact, it's believed that our coal supplies are larger than any single energy source of any single nation, including Saudi Arabian oil. The U.S. coal supply is equivalent to nearly 800 billion barrels of oil, more than three times the energy equivalent of Saudi Arabia's oil. I'll bet many Americans don't know that coal can be converted into a fuel that is comparable to gasoline and can power any automobile. If we used coal to its fullest potential, we could turn our backs on the Middle East and never look back. Right now, the type of scenario laid out in the oil shockwave simulation is possible, and this scenario could cause major disruptions to our economy. But there are some indications that it might not have the same impact as that of the 1970s oil crises. For every unit of economic output, the U.S. now uses half the energy it did in 1980. Let me repeat that. For every unit of economic output, the U.S. now uses half the energy it did in 1980. Energy costs are a smaller percentage of household budgets now than they were then, even though some people would find that hard to believe. Assessing our own natural energy reserves probably couldn't happen as quickly as an oil shockwave. We should work to change that. Through research and development of new technologies, we can prepare for the worst. We have the energy supplies. All we really need is the intellectual energy and the political will to put them to work. And I thank the chair. I thank the gentleman. Uh, and now we turn and recognize the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer, thank for you, an Mr. opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I too, appreciate our witnesses uh, spending time with us this morning and sharing their experience. Uh, I have been following the exercise for some time um, and been intrigued by the power to be able to demonstrate how perilous uh, we are balanced today on our petroleum dependence. Um, I'm. In my community, we had uh, over a year ago uh, the city government forming a task force to explore these vulnerabilities, and 12 distinguished citizens came back with things that wouldn't surprise our participants, uh, but it was, I think, an important part in sort of driving where we are going. I appreciate the comments of the distinguished ranking member, but uh, one of the downsides of what he's describing is that uh, there are no technologies now available that don't make the other part of our um, charge as a committee fighting against global warming and greenhouse gases that don't make them worse. Um, the simple fact is that we are the largest consumer of petroleum. We have, uh, we're consuming it at a rate 10 times what our share of the world's proven supplies are, and we're depleting our own reserves right now at a very rapid rate. And uh, given secu our security concerns for the future, those ought to be the last areas that we try and pump as fast as we can, rather than the first, or in the case of the Arctic, the next. Mr. Chairman, one of the things that I would hope that you would uh, consider, and, and this, we've, uh, the work that we've done have encouraged us to look far afield, and we all have good ideas, like you know where you should go for a committee hearing and who we turn to next. I know it's a very wide and rich field, and I think you've done a great job of balancing it. But one of the things that might be interesting would be for our committee to spend 
the better part of a day experiencing the simulation, uh, having uh, dealt with the people who've designed it, having watched it from afar. Um, I think that it might shake some of us out of our lethargy if we actually stop pontificating and actually go through a simulation where we have to make some of these realized life decisions that we as a Congress have failed to mitigate. And if our committee might set the tone, Mr. Chairman, I think it might be, uh, there might be other people on both sides of the aisle who would go through it. And if we could get even 10 percent of the members of Congress to have to go through this, devoting only half a day, I think it would be a sort of a homework that might put some realism into what too often around here is, um, uh, I think, rather hollow rhetoric because I think all of us ought to have a sense of urgency for the very reasons you mentioned in your open statement. And I would hope that we might consider it because uh, it's too good a model for us not to uh, at least, I think, test. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. It's a, that is a great idea. I think we'll, we'll try to do that. We'll try to set something up that can give each one of the members that experience. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It, it's difficult to follow a, 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 a powerful sermon uh, like the one that just delivered by Mr. Blumenauer, uh, which I would say uh, amen uh, to uh, what he, he, he just said. Uh, as I read this morning uh, a number of uh, newspapers, including the Financial Times, uh, about what is going on in uh, Pakistan, uh, I became alarmed, not because Pakistan is a supplier of oil, but because uh, if uh, things go further awry, uh, it could completely destabilize uh, the, uh, the Middle East in ways that Iraq never could. And, uh, and thinking about what, what is going on in Iran and, and hopefully um, dealing with this concern uh, internally, I could not help but think, it could, that conflict in, in Pakistan, uh, if, it, if it ends up in some kind of civil war, uh, and if uh, the tribal areas get weapons, there's no telling, get more weapons, U.S. weapons, uh, there's no telling what, what could happen. But uh, uh, it, it occurred to me that even in, in the midst of all of these developments in the, in the, in the Middle East, um, that we are not even after the Al Gore film and, and all of the discussion, we are not uh, uh, retreating uh, from our um, appetite uh, for, for oil. Uh, in 1980, uh, the United States imported 27 percent of the oil it uses each day. And today, we are importing 60 percent of the oil we use each day. So it's, it's not like all of the awareness is, is creating uh, some reaction. It is what Mr. Blumen Blumenauer said. You know, we, we, we talk about it, and then we just continue to, to, to go ahead. We continue to, to splurge. This is chilling. And so I, I'm looking forward to uh, hearing your comments and then uh, engaging dialo uh, dialogically, because I, I'm, I'm, I'm also frustrated that we, we are not moving, and, and, and maybe something will happen after November. Of next year. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from California, Ms. Solis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to welcome our witnesses and look forward to your testimony. I'll submit my statement for the record. Thank you. Great. The gentlelady's time has expired, and uh, we'll move to our witnesses. Uh, our first witness uh, is Admiral Dennis Blair, who served as Commander in Chief of the uh, U.S. Pacific Command, the largest of the combatant commands. Um, Admiral Blair um, is a Rhodes Scholar, uh, and he currently is a member of the Energy Security Leadership Council, a group of U.S. military and business leaders united to address America's energy and national security crisis. Whenever you're ready, Admiral, please begin. Okay, no, I, I'd, be, I'd be glad to follow um, uh, your lead. Um, Carol Browner, we will begin with, uh, 
with uh, you, uh, Carol Browner was the uh, head of the uh, Environmental uh, Protection uh, Agency. Uh, she previously had served as the Secretary of State of Florida's Department of Environmental uh, Regulation. Uh, before that, she was Legislative Director for U.S. Senator uh, Al Gore. Um, she um, is without question one of the leading experts in the world uh, on environmental and energy issues. Uh, we welcome you, um, Ms. Brown, whenever you are ready, please begin. Thank you. Could you uh, push the... Uh, Got it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You would think I would remember how to do that. I did spend a, a few hours up here testifying during my eight-year tenure at the EPA. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you uh, today and um, to share with you um, the, the experience we had uh, in oil shockwave uh, 2007. But let me first congratulate you, Mr. Chairman, and, and all of the members of this committee for the work that you're doing. It is incredibly important, uh, as you all know, to the people of this country. There are very tough issues to be addressed, and uh, I personally appreciate the time and energy you are bringing to bear. Um, as you heard from the Admiral, I appear today as a participant in the recent oil shockwave executive oil crisis simulation. Uh, it is the second time I have done this. There was one several years earlier that I also participated in. And um, I think, it, it, let me just set the stage for how this scenario unfolds. First of all, the event was sponsored by Securing America's Future Energy Safe and the Bipartisan Policy Center. And it was designed to show the possible consequences of U.S. oil dependency and the ability of government officials to respond in the event of a global oil crisis. It's extremely important that you understand this was not a partisan effort. Um, it was bipartisan in every way. The, the participants were divided between Democrat and Republicans. And the whole point is just to, to the best of our ability, demonstrate to the American people how a problem unfolds and how members of the President's uh, council and senior staff might respond uh, to that uh, problem. It provides, I think, a number of important lessons uh, for, for the Congress as you uh, look at the issues in front of you. Three, in, in the scenario that we did most recently last week, three different things happened over a three-month period. Uh, the year is um, 2009. It is post the election. There is no assumption in the scenario whether a Democrat or Republican has won uh, the election for president. Uh, it is unclear in the, in the conversations, but over a three-month period from May to August of 2009. Uh, the first thing that happens is that a pipeline in Azerbaijan is uh, temporarily put out of service. The result of that is a loss of one million barrels of oil to the world's markets per day. And very quickly, there's an upturn in prices. While this crisis is resolved in the course of the scenario, over the next three months, Nigeria takes 400,000 barrels a day off the market, and in August, Iran and Venezuela cut their combined oil production by 700,000 barrels per day. So by the end of the simulation, the three-month period, 1.1 million barrels of oil have been taken off the world market, and the price per barrel has shot up to over $160. Again, it was, a, it was a simulation, but I don't think any of this is far-fetched. Uh, maybe not these precise things, but certainly things like this could happen uh, virtually any day. Um, as, a, as is common in scenarios, uh, each of us play a role. The role that I was assigned was Secretary of Energy. And in this position, I was uh, supposed to suggest a series of short-term steps that could be taken by the American public to reduce oil use. Uh, for example, I raised with my cabinets in the uh, simulation, which was uh, chaired by Bob Rubin, uh, that we could impose a 55-mile-per-hour speed limit, which would save 134,000 to approximately 250,000 barrels of oil per day. Uh, we could implement year-round daylight savings time, which would save approximately 3,000 barrels per day. Uh, we could institute a Sunday driving ban, which would save about 475,000 barrels uh, per day. Uh, suffice it to say, uh, my colleagues in this event, other cabinet members, uh, rejected these ideas. They did not think they would be uh, acceptable to the American um, people. 
Uh, that turned the discussion to whether or not we should access the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, which, as you know, is under the auspices of the Secretary of Energy. And very quickly, a debate ensued over two issues with respect to the SPRO. Uh, the first was, what is the appropriate use of the SPRO? Can you use it to manage price spikes, or can you only use it for security um, matters? Um, and uh, as, as Mr. Sensenbrenner pointed out, uh, there are significant uh, barrels there, but the truth of the matter, not so significant that if this crisis had played out over a longer term that you could really answer the problem. The second debate that unfolded over the SPRO uh, went to whose oil is it? And uh, several of the individuals participating in the scenario representing various, uh, I think the Department of State, the Department of Defense raised uh, the issue as to whether or not does the military get first call as opposed to the American people. And the concern they, they were focused on was uh, with growing unrest in the world in this scenario, would they have to deploy additional troops and therefore be in need of additional uh, oil, and should they get a first uh, call on it? I think the real lesson of oil shock, and one that we seem unfortunately hard pressed to learn, is the need to think ahead, uh, to make real and lasting commitments to a new approach rather than wait to respond once we're in the thick of it. Um, Short-term energy conservation is, is frequently difficult, painful, and I think that was in part why uh, the, the other participants in this scenario did not want to recommend to the fictional president uh, that we take some of these um, steps. Um, as I look at this scenario and, and, and move into the issues that confront you as a committee today in, in the House and the Senate writ large, I think the single most important thing would be to embrace CAFE. Uh, if there had been a CAFE standard such as uh, being uh, considered uh, and passed by the Senate, in effect, uh, during this scenario, we would not have experienced the kind of problems. Uh, potentially would not have experienced the kind of problems that were unfolding in this scenario. The Senate CAFE proposal, if adopted this year, would result in an oil savings of around 1.2 million barrels per day by 2020. Uh, if you take into account the Senate renewable fuel mandates, the estimated number of barrels of oil saved each day uh, from uh, the Senate passed biofuel expansions would be 1 million. It brings you to a total of 2.2 uh, million. That would have been more than twice the reduction that was needed by the end of oil uh, shockwave. In, in, in closing, um, let me again note that this is the second time I have participated in this scenario. I think I was the only person who's participated both times. And the lesson was the same. We need to get going. There are things we can be doing today to try and reduce our dependence. Uh, CAFE is certainly not the only thing, but I personally think it is an incredibly important thing. The other thing I would just note, and to, to Mr. Blumenauer's point, the scenario did not take into account global warming. Um, as the Secretary of Energy, I tried to insert it into um, the, the discussion, um, but the, the focus, because it was such an immediate concern, Concern, always turned back to where do we get more oil quickly? What do we need to do today um, to solve the problem? I think certainly as we think about these issues, it is absolutely essential uh, that we think about uh, what some of the alternatives may mean in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, in terms of our carbon footprint, in terms of uh, how much more difficult do we make the task of reducing greenhouse gas emissions and carbon emissions. And so I thank you for the opportunity uh, to share with you what I thought was a, a, a really uh, tremendous um, scenario and I think a very enlightening one. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Uh, Admiral Blair, whenever you are ready, um, please begin. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, let me, on behalf of the Securing America's Future Energy Project, accept what I think was a, a, a request that we, um, that we conduct an oil shock simulation, making it available to members of the committee. I think that's wonderful. We'll do it. We'll provide. We'll bring it here. We can do it uh, somewhere else. And I think it's uh, just a wonderful thing because when you talk to people like Carol Browning who've been in it, they're, they're not the same after they've done it uh, from what they were before. It just brings an immediacy to this rather theoretical discussion that I think gives you the burn to do something about it. And, and we, we will uh, gladly uh, set that up in any way that's convenient for you. And um, <clears throat> I, I see from the opening statements that what I'm doing is just uh, pouring gasoline on a flame that already exists in terms of the uh, understanding of the issue and the immediacy for it. But let me do that, because I spent 
more than three decades in the, in the armed forces, in the, in the Navy, and in joint commands. And as I think back over my career, so many times when we sent our young men and women into combat, it was because we hadn't taken prudent smaller action earlier, and we paid late, later with our treasure and their blood for the things that should have been done long, long before. And I think this is really what impels those of us who are retired senior military officers who serve on this Energy Security Leadership Council, is that we want to advocate actions which are, they're not easy, but they're doable now in order not to be reduced to the sorts of desperate measures that uh, we saw in the oil shock wave. And in fact, the, the steady militarizing of many volatile and underdeveloped areas of the world that has gone on over the time that I've been in the armed forces from the days that we used to handle the Middle East with a couple of ships and a one-star admiral to now we have an entire unified command, the Central Command. We have hundreds of thousands of troops that are there all the time in an area that's halfway around the world that takes three ships to support every trip boat ship that's over there, that takes three soldiers or Marines to support every Marine that's over there, one who's there, one who's traveling, one who's back home cleaning up, getting ready to go, to go back again. And so the burn that those of us who are on the Council who served in the Armed Forces is let's do the smart things now to avoid having to do the dangerous, bloody, expensive things uh, things later. Uh, Ms. Browner re reviewed the, the essence of the um, shockwave simulation that we did last, last week. Uh, let me just um, review some of the lessons that I observed uh, from uh, watching it and, and having been involved in the week of the Council. And, and as, you, as you saw there, we, we could have oil that's 100 barrels today. In this simulation, it was over 160, uh, in just with a couple of relatively small things affecting 1% of the, um, of the wor world oil, oil supply. And these were the lessons I drew from it. The first is that there's really no such thing as foreign oil. Oil is fungible. A change in supplier demand anywhere will affect prices everywhere. So distant places um, mean real things to Americans. I, I sometimes think that think the good Lord is laughing, looking down at us in the places that he put the oil in the world, you know. <laughs> he put them in these faraway places with uh, very uh, unstable and uh, difficult volatile situations, and a little tremor there affects all of us at the, at the pump. And the second is that because of the, the tight um, supply situation now, the oil markets are precariously balanced. Even small disruptions have dramatic effects because of the lack of the buffer. I, I think um, we, talked, we talked about it earlier that what used to be a 4 million barrel a day Saudi buffer is down. It might be 1.65 million, as, as you say, Mr. Chairman. It, it could well be less. Hard to tell with the, uh, with the lack of transparency there. But we're, we're just on a, we're on a hair trigger, trigger here. Second, when we have gotten to the point that these supply disruptions occur, they, there just aren't many short-term options. As I watched uh, Ms. Browner and, and people like uh, like uh, Secretary Rubin, Secretary Armitage, General Abizade wrestling with questions. There weren't any good short-term options. It was all really, really ugly, and all of them thought, geez, if we just done something 10 years ago, five years ago, we wouldn't have to be doing it. And don't we owe our successors five, 10 years down the road some efforts now so that they are not put in this, uh, this terrible, terrible position? The, uh, the next one is that, um, this uh, strategic petroleum reserve is not the final answer. It, it doesn't sol solve the uh, problems. And as you saw, real decision, experienced decision makers uh, res wrestling with it. Uh, Ms. Browner was certainly an advocate for, for using it. The kinds of object objections around the table by serious people with serious responsibilities made you realize that this is not a magic wand that we can, uh, that we can w wave. So we've got to do, we've got to do more. And and finally, although we didn't um, explore it quite as much as we should have, this is an inter international problem. It, we have got to be talking with the Saudi Arabias, the Chinas, the Indias, the, the, the suppliers on the one hand, the great consumers on the other hand. China and India now are not 
members of the IEA. They're not part of the team that coordinates uh, strategic petroleum reserve uh, action. Uh, they would be affected by it, as, as, would, uh, as would, would everyone. Uh, and we have, um, this just drives us to get international groupings together, thinking now, taking prudent American actions so that we're not put in this uh, p position. And it really brings us back to what all of us have thought in this area, is that we need both greater conservation and increased production, both of the uh, petro petroleum substitutes like coal, uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, more drilling of the petroleum that we do, we do have, also development of smart synthetic alternatives. There's not, there's not a magic bullet for this thing. We can't, we can't have a technological breakthrough out of it in the near term that's going to solve it. We've got to do all, th affect everything, supply, demand, uh, al alternatives. And so there are a lot of lessons from 9-11. One, one of them is that if, unless we take action early to put national security on our terms rather than allowing vulnerabilities that other people can do it to, to us, we really fail in our duties. And we really have to have a long-term strategy for reducing America's oil dependence. It's a grave national economic security. It demands a bipartisan approach. And it goes beyond the Congress through the administration to the American people, who I think are ready to support action on this, as long as it's done in a way that has everybody taking the action, that spreads the sacrifices, and is clearly directed towards the, towards the national interest. As Ms. Browner said, there's a bill out of the Senate. I, I testified before the Senate uh, Commerce Committee uh, earlier, earlier this year that works on an important part of the problem, setting, um, setting the uh, auto efficiency standards uh, goals to increase every, every year. I would emphasize that it's a, because it's an attribute-based attribute system, it's a big improvement over the uh, system we put in the, in the 70s, the one that was in part responsible for the gains that Mr. Sensenbrenner mentioned in which we halved our oil intensity of the economy. But this, is, this compares like model to like model, so it does not put the Detroit Big Three at a, at a disadvantage. I'm absolutely convinced that smart American engineering ingenuity and good American workers can, under this pr proposal, you know, knock the socks off any foreign competitors, sell, sell cars, lots of good cars that will not only be safe and will have the right performance, but will be uh, much less thirsty for, for oil. And in addition to that, we needed to go on, we need to go on to the other parts of the program, smart alternatives, the sorts of R&D investments in order to bring them, on, them online, whether they're cellulosic methanol, uh, to complement the, the ethanol that we're getting from corn, whether it be an, a uh, energy uh, efficient and environmentally safe uh, use of the, the coal uh, conversion or the oil sands that are, that are already exist. We've got to continue with this three-part program if we are to avoid the sorts of things that we saw in this shockwave and if we are to do the right thing by our children, our grandchildren, and by the men in uniform, men and women in uniform, who will have to pay the price someday unless we act now. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Admiral, very much. Um, let me turn and recognize uh, for an opening round of questions the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Admiral, I, I appreciate your uh, willingness to uh, uh, inflict the simulation on us, and I appreciate the Chairman's <laughs> interest in perhaps exploring that as a, as a committee uh, hearing. Um, I have, uh, we, we actually did one of these versions in my community a year ago uh, involving uh, campus-based activities. We actually mm -hmm. fell short in trying to structure it for our governor and, and some of our other community leaders. But could, just for the committee, could you outline what it would, what it would entail? Uh, we didn't really get the details we, we, um, in terms of the, the number, the duration, um, the roles that were played. Just. Mm -hmm. How would that work for the committee if we were to uh, follow up on your generous offer? Um, we, or maybe we can do it together. Yeah, yeah. Um, in, uh, in both of the, the national simulations that have been done, it's approximately 10 people who participate. Uh, you have usually the president's chief of staff who sort of runs um, the, the conversation. You have uh, everybody uh, 
from the Secretary of Energy, Department, uh, Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, National Security Advisor, sort of a, 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 a so, so there would joint be a chiefs of staff. So there are, there are roles that are assigned. And you are, to the best of your ability, asked to play the role. And so you're given facts that might be particular to, to the role that you're playing. You can bring in, you know, sort of personal information or experiences, but you do have to stay um, within in your role. Um, Bob Rubin, who was the, the who was sort of the master of ceremonies, if you will, the chief of staff for, for this particular um, exercise was, was very, very good at making sure all of the points, as he was when he served in, in the last administration, making sure all of the points were, were put on the table. You then have briefers who come into the cabinet room, uh, the simulated cabinet room or situation room, and start changing the scenario on you. Um, and sometimes they, they use reports. There's like a CNN-style uh, TV show that's been manufactured that is providing new information, or they are simply briefers who are considered to be experts who are adding uh, new facts. It took us about two and a half hours um, to do it, and then we had sort of 30 minutes of reflection. Uh, we stepped out of our individual roles and sort mm -hmm. of reflected from our experiences either in that role or our previous um, I, I, you know, when I was in the prior administration, this is something that cabinet members do. In fact, the last simulation that I participated in as a member of, of, of the President Clinton's cabinet was a anthrax scare. Uh, this would have been in, um, I think it was shortly uh, before um, the 2000 election. Uh, most of us couldn't pronounce the word anthrax when we showed up for the simulation. Now most Americans are too, unfortunately, aware of it. Um, but in, you know, whether it was in the government or in, in, in this one, um, the, the, the value of these is, is really quite significant because, as, as the Admiral said, what you quickly figure out is even with all of this power behind you, I mean, as Secretary of Energy, I had huge amounts of power in this simulation. Your choices in terms of immediate action are very, very narrow. And even those choices immediately bump up with somebody else's view of the world. So, for example, I said, yes, we should access the SPRO. Well, that got complicated in a hurry because um, I think it was the Secretary of Defense uh, said, well, you know, that's the Navy's. And it, I actually didn't know this about the history of the SPRO. It actually originates back to the Navy. And so suddenly we couldn't, you know, find common ground on whether or not to take advantage of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. And I, I think for that reason it's worth doing. Things that you think may be sort of automatic and easily done, you find out are not so automatic and easily done. So it, in, in terms of uh, with the technical help uh, that uh, you folks have developed uh, over, the, over the years, uh, there would be a role potentially for every member of the committee and could be conducted in the, in the framework essentially of what uh, a significant hearing would be. It would be a large cabinet. <laughs> exactly. I mean, we would, the, the time commitment, uh, Mr. Mumenauer, is probably two hours, sometime a day or two ahead of time just to be given some basic data and to be told how the game works. And then we'd start at, um, you know, 10 o'clock in, in, in the morning. Uh, you know, Mr. Markey might be playing the National Security Advisor. You might be playing the Secretary of Defense. Mr. Sen Sensenbrenner might be playing the Secretary of Energy. And in comes a card that says the President wants a recommendation in two hours as to what he's supposed to do because these things have, these things have happened. And then the National Security Advisor and the, maybe the Chairman of the uh, National Economic Committee is there says, "Okay, what do we think? What are we going to What are we going to tell the President?" And uh, and so you 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 bat that around. It, it drives you the, the the time element drives you to have to sharpen your thinking. You can't just do nothing because time's tick, ticking away. And and then and then you make that recommendation and then say, "Fast forward a week. Now these other things happen. Now what are you going to do, big guy?" And um, President wants some better options, and and we also had uh, uh, the president's pr press secretary, and he was wonderful because he said, "You're going to have the president do what?" So it's kind of that immediacy and, and the and the feeling of responsible people doing tough jobs that that I think lives with you. And we'd have you all in the role. It would take, as I say, two hours ahead of time just to be ready, and then four hours on the day. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the uh, gentleman from Wisconsin, the Secretary of Energy, Mr. Sensenbrenner. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. First of all, let me say I shudder to think of the chair as National Security Advisor. Could you put him in another role, please? And I think we'll all be happier. Uh, um, and you know, and 
looking at you know how we war game the the, uh, the strategy and what we can do ahead of time, the one question I have is what's the role of Canadian oil resources and oil shale in the West? Uh, I know that you can't turn that spigot on uh, as quickly as we'd like, but if we're looking at ways to prevent an oil shock from being extremely severe, that seems to be the most convenient and secure way to get increased uh, oil or replacement oil. Right, our, the position that the, uh, that the uh, Council took uh, in the report that we released uh, almost uh, a year ago was that the Canadian uh, tar sands resources are, would be a big part of the problem as soon as they could be done in an energy efficient and, and an environmentally ex acceptable, acceptable way. So we saw that as, as part of the solution, but our understanding was that the technology was not quite there on those two uh, criteria, so we couldn't, uh, we couldn't uh, we couldn't count on that, and that, uh, but that the R&D should be put in to see if it's a, uh, um, an, a viable alternative as an alternative source. Simil similarly, R&D should be put into other syn synthetic uh, uh, fuels in order to in order to make them uh, part of, part of the solution. So, it, it didn't seem to us looking across the looking across that alternative as well as others that there was one that you say had all the right attributes right now to be able to solve the problem. More work was needed. Um, oil shock um, scenario did not deal with, you know, could you explore uh, and find other resources because it was a real time. You had to solve the problem, you know, that day, that, that week. Um, you know, I, I think SAFE has taken a position on whether or not some of the, the thoughts you have um, are viable in, in the short term, and um, I, I share their, their concerns that in the short term they're probably not. Um, they may also uh, bring with them some other challenges. Uh, for example, we need to understand, this is me personally speaking, um, as someone who is very concerned about greenhouse gas and global warming, um, what are the repercussions? Are we adding to our global warming footprint? Are we diminishing it? Um, and, and I think that's something that you know, still needs to be better understood. I, I think part of the issue is where are the technologies and what are the technologies that we would end up using, because that may have some bearing on what are the emissions. Uh, thank you. I yield back the balance of my time. Great. The uh, gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from uh, Missouri, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, one of the, the problems we have, I, I think, is that we live in, in, in a time in our country where everything is politicized. I, I'm um, frustrated over how we have politicized uh, global warming, uh, how we politicize even the oil crisis. And so it's difficult for us to uh, coalesce and move toward a, a solution because uh, what we say and think uh, reverberates across the land. And if you listen to radio and television talk shows, you can see what has happened. It's, it's, a, it's, it's ugly out there. And, and rather than turn down the volume, we continue to turn it up. So, so this issue has already become muddy uh, because of the way we have, uh, be, be, because of the way it is, is politicized. Uh, do you have any suggestions on how we might be able to depoliticize uh, the um, oil uh, dependence uh, issue or, or independence? Is there something you can suggest that we do, say? Can we write a, a, a song? Could we get Mr. Hall to write a hit song? Uh, I mean, what, what do we need to do? Yes, sir. My, uh, an admiral giving advice on politics is like a politician giving advice on maneuvering ships. So I, I <laughs> venture into this with great. <laughs> 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 but what, what those of us in the council thought was that that what, what's required here is a, is a compromise between those who have opposed uh, um, fuel efficiency standards on the grounds that it's interfering with uh, business and those who have opposed uh, further exploration and development of alternatives on the, ground, uh, on the grounds that it uh, is, uh, runs environmental risks and it's not pretty to have an oil rig out your ba back door. What, 
What we strongly recommended a year ago was that in order to provide the political cover for everybody to do what everybody recognizes in, is in the national interest is both sides have to give, and it's got to be a comprehensive package so that, um, so that uh, it's, it's recognized that all participants are, are doing the right thing for the country, and even though they can be accused of, um, of making compromises with something that they pushed in the past, it's in the common, it's in the common good. And, and that's really, it's naive, it's kind of Civics 101. I'm not a politician, but I think that, I think that it, it's sort of the time that we all have to give a little to do the right thing for, for, for everybody. So our, my answer to your question would be to, um, you know, both sides of that center chair need to give a little bit and, uh, and let's, let's do more conservation, let's do more domestic production, let's do more all, alternatives. We, we've, taken, we've taken polling data uh, within the country and, and, and the people recognize it, but it's getting that popular support shredded through the filter of individual interests into a bill, which you all know better than I do, is, uh, is, the, is the hard part of this. But it seems at the end of the day, if it's comprehensive, then the people will have felt that their elected representatives, whether in the executive branch or in the on the legislative side, have done the right thing for the country. So that's kind of a naive answer, Mr. Cleaver, but that's, that's the one that I would give. Mr. Cleaver, I mean, I, I, I think the simulation actually would be uh, a way in which you might find some common ground. In the simulation we did, there were three of us who were noted Democrats. Everyone knew we were Democrats, although we were not playing Democrats or Republicans. There were three that are well-known Republicans. You would recognize them immediately as Republicans. And then there were some former military brass who were never sure what they are. Um, they're very good <laughs> about that. Um, but, you know, what happened is we were unanimous in our takeaway from the experience. So it didn't matter what our political persuasion was when we came to um, the scenario. Our experience of the scenario was it was a shared one, and what we thought needed to be done uh, was, was remarkably similar across the party lines when we stepped out at the end and resumed our, our regular identities. And so I, I think, you know, it, it, it could go a long ways towards perhaps bridging some of the, uh, the gaps that inevitably exist as you all wrestle with in important legislation. And if that doesn't work, I agree Mr. Hall should write a song. <laughs> Great. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Shattuck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, um, and I want to thank our witnesses. I want to apologize for being late. I want to thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, I appreciate the work you're doing in this area. Uh, and I uh, share your comments, Ms. Browner, about, you know, you set aside the policy, the partisanship, and we need to be working on the problem. In that regard, I noticed in your testimony uh, that you applaud a, the renewable uh, electricity standard in the House Energy Bill. Uh, I do as well, except I have some concern. Both of you, Admiral Blair and yourself, have talked about the importance of conserving, uh, using less. Uh, and obviously, the more we can rely on renewable fuels, the better off we are. One of the concerns I have is that uh, there is this ongoing struggle, unfortunately I believe somewhat partisan in nature, over what to value uh, achievements in efficiency. In my state of Arizona, we, can, we have some renewables we can use. My friends from the Deep South look at me and say, don't impose renewable standards on us, we can't do it. Uh, and in both instances, I hear from the industry that efficiency gains, at least in the short term, hold great potential. Uh, I know, for exa example, that I pay the Shattuck family electricity bill, and I've found myself out on the stepladder pulling out those old incandescent bulbs and putting in uh, um, uh, the uh, fluorescent ones everywhere I can, and I'm happy to save myself money. Um, do you think that legislation strikes the right balance, or do you think we should go further in rewarding, at least in the short term, and maybe it is just in the short term, to educate Americans and incentivize them uh, to use uh, uh, more efficient appliances, more efficient lighting, more efficient uh, uh, consumption of energy in every way? You've talked about CAFE standards. Obviously, that's a, a big and a critical one, particularly in the fuel, in the, in the oil area, where uh, for transportation purposes, oil is where we are excessively dependent now. Right. But just my question is, how about, uh, yeah, I guess, do you think we've struck the right balance on rewarding efficiency savings in the renewable standard in the legislation we passed? 
Um, I, I think it is absolutely essential that uh, the country gets on with making a commitment to a national standard. I mean, look, th the states are doing it. They're figuring out how to make it happen. You've got, I think, 20 states now that have embraced some sort of renewable electricity standard. Obviously, electricity is different than oil. Um, the, the one thing, in terms of the, of the right balance, I, here, I'll just be pragmatic. It's the right balance if you can pass it, yeah. quite frankly. I mean, we're, we're down to sort of it's time to get this passed. I mean, it's, it, it is unfortunate that we haven't been able to do it thus far, and I understand everyone's working hard, but it's really time to get it done. One thing that I have become increasingly interested in is how do you reward utilities for efficiency? You know, right now, if I'm running a utility, I make money when I sell electricity. It is that simple. Now, a few states, California has looked at something called decoupling, uh, but people like Jim Rogers, who run one of the biggest uh, East Coast utilities, Duke Energy, is talking uh, to the North Carolina uh, PUC about allowing him to make money when his utility conserves, rewarding uh, conservation by the utility. And, and that may be a way of getting at what you're suggesting, how you get at it on the individual consumer. Um, obviously, there are tax credits and things like that um, that could, could be brought to bear. Um, but you know, I'm not wedded to one particular answer. What I'm wedded to is let's get a real standard. Let's send the message to the marketplace that people who make um, appliances, people who use large amounts of utility are going to have to start thinking differently about what they're doing. One of the things I learned as eight years as a regulator is that once you set that standard, whatever it is, it's a pollution standard, air, water, allowing some flexibility so that businesses can find the most common sense cost effective way to get there inevitably gets you a, you know, a better answer than government sort of trying to dictate each little tiny you know, piece of the puzzle. Sometimes we need to dictate some of those because not everyone is going to, you know, follow the path. But in, in, in most instances, if you were to figure out a way to, I think, reward utilities for efficiency, you could be very, you would be very, very pleased with the response you would get. My public owned utility, there are two major electricity utilities in the Phoenix metropolitan area. Uh, one is an investor owned, one is a public owned. The public one is coming to see me and they have very innovative programs and they're arguing, yeah, we have renewable resources we can use here in Arizona, but we'd also like to get rewarded for efficiency because they understand the system incentivizes them to sell. Admiral Blair, your comments on, the, on, on that point? Yes, sir, I, I, uh, I haven't uh, looked at the entire interconnected energy picture. I'm really most concerned about the uh, amount of petroleum from unstable places, which brings me to the transportation sector, which brings me to uh, production of petroleum, petroleum substitutes, and, uh, and imports. So Fair enough. I'm going to run out of time. I just ran right. out of time. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, gentlemen's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentle lady from California, Ms. Solis. Thank you, and again, welcome to our witnesses. Um, in, in your scenario, uh, Shockwave, I know you mentioned that you really didn't have time to, to do long-term planning. But given uh, diplomatic or lack of diplomatic efforts, could you shed some light on that? Because you mentioned in this scenario that Iran and Venezuela would, would uh, cut off uh, supplies. What, what, in your opinion, can we do to help maybe prepare for these kinds of disasters that may occur? And what steps can we take? Was there anyone talking about that at all in this role playing? Um, yeah, when we, at the end, after, remember, we're getting presented with mm -hmm. facts. We don't necessarily have an explanation for why the particular fact has unfolded. It's just presented as a fact. And so the fact, we were given the fact that Iran and, and Venezuela were doing X, and we had to then, you know, quickly respond so the president could respond to, to the, the American people. Um, when we stepped out of our roles, I think a, a number of people uh, from, from sort of the military um, side, uh, you know, talked about the fact that how we build relationships, how we maintain relationships uh, with various regions of the world, with uh, various leaders is, is absolutely essential. There's no, again, not a single problem we confronted in this scenario had a perfect answer or a single answer. All of it was about things you do over a period of time, in some instances, a very long period of time. I think, Ms. Ms. Solis, that the, I, I draw a contrast between the way we deal with countries that really don't have our economic interests in their, in their hand and those who, those who do. And when, when I was a commander in, in the Pacific, we could deal with countries in Southeast Asia, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, problem, some other uh, 
other problem countries, and we weren't completely dependent on them for oil supplies, so we could be a little sophisticated in our, in our, in our dealing with them. We didn't have to turn to big, expensive, um, hair-trigger military options right off the bat. By way of contrast, when we're dealing with countries who are controlling important parts of the world's oil supply, we are we are we militarize our policy um, almost by by default. So, what we feel is if if we can drop the oil intensity of the United States economy, that is the the amount of um, oil to produce every dollar of GDP, and as Mr. Sensenbrenner said, we we drop that between it, after the first oil problems in the 70s and the and the 80s. But but then it leveled out, and we are as dependent as as we all we all know now. If we can do a combination of uh, conservation and domestic uh, alternatives, uh, get that down again, then we're, we're not as subject to being jacked around by mm -hmm. these, uh, these events and by these, these countries. So it, it really is a case of, of lowering our, our dependence on this as an, an economy to give these people who are in these shockwave events a little more, a little more flexibility so that they can, they can have time to round up international support so that, so that they can use other, other maneuvers. And it's, it's just getting them on that hair trigger by the increased uh, demand and the increased dependence that, is, uh, that, ma that makes it so brutal when, when you, you come to one of these crisis situations like a pipeline that pops or a, or a measure. So it, it's really that, that dependence that we need to, to work on. I, I raise that issue because we've seen a lot of uh, climatic changes in Latin America, and I want to talk specifically about Mexico because we do import a lot of, of petroleum from Mexico. It was a, a very uh, bad flood that occurred in Tabasco where they have a really large refinery. And I'm wondering, um, things like that that occur, we may not feel immediately, but they will have an impact uh, a couple of months down the line. And I just, I just would hope that our leaders, our policymakers, would start thinking about how we can help provide assistance to our friends, mm -hmm. democratically elected governments, that we should be helping to nurture and doing things in a, in a manner that's, that conserves, that's energy efficient, that th has a less uh, negative footprint on the environment. And I just want to throw that out there. And then CAFE standards, just quickly, I had a meeting with some folks from the Automobile uh, Alliance, and they uh, were trying to explain to me that, well, you know, it's really about the demand out there, the consumer's uh, thirst for uh, these pickup trucks and what have you, and I, and I um, just wanted to ask, ask if you could comment on that, Ms. Browner. Um, I just want to remind everybody that the EPA, which I had the opportunity to run for eight years, does not handle CAFE. So I, I am not a, a familiar with the program from a regula regulator mm -hmm. perspective, but obviously have, have studied it. Um, it is handled by the Department of Transportation. I think the, the Admiral, um, as he said earlier, what's important about the CAFE proposal is that it is car to car. It is not manufacturer to manufacturer. Um, and so the opportunity for, you know, the American public to continue to, to look at the vehicles they want uh, is, is preserved. Um, having said that, again, my experience of, as a regulator does tell me that you set the standard and you know what? Good old American innovation and ingenuity rises to the challenge. I mean, when Congress in 1990 banned chlorofluorocarbon, CFCs, widely used in refrigeration, um, people, you know, in this body and in, in the Senate said, oh my God, what are we going to do? We're going to have to drive our cars without air conditioning. We're not going to have, you know, sort of life as we know it. Well, guess what? Once Congress said it's gone on a date certain, a company saw an opportunity, brought a technology to the market for less money, faster than anyone envisioned. When I set the tailpipe emission standards for diesel engines, it was one of the last things I did when I was in office, one of the things we could require was not just clean sulfur fuel, but also that there be a catalytic converter put on big diesel trucks and diesel cars. It didn't exist. The scientists, the engineers were still figuring it out. Once they knew there was a guaranteed market on a date certain, they figured it out pretty darn quickly. And so I, I never, ever want to underestimate American innovation and ingenuity. We have a long history of rising to the challenge. Good point. Thank you very much. Would, would you like to add to that, uh, Admiral? You have your... Yeah, just, just one thing. Uh, so as I agree completely with... Uh, with Ms. Brown, and I've heard these, I've talked with the same car companies, and they're, they're saying that um, American people don't want um, more efficient cars. They want more powerful cars with more cup holders, and, and therefore we have to, uh, we have to give it to them. Um, 
I, I think, as Ms. Brown says, they're, they're underestimating what they can produce. I think they're way underestimating the American public who understand that we all need to have cars that are more fuel efficient, even if we have to sacrifice that top end performance uh, 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 that we have. But, the, but uh, they're waiting to be told, let's all do it together. Let's, let's set a standard that applies to everybody rather than, rather than one, that's, one, one that's uneven. Uh, and I also, frankly, I don't have a lot of sympathies for these car companies because the price of that oil that we are using does not reflect the full price of the American troops who are doing all this business around, around the world. If you factored in the real price of that oil, it would be huge. And frankly, I'm sorry, it's not up to the car companies to make that judgment. It's up to the leaders of the American people to make that judgment. Thank you. General Lady's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the General Lady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank uh, both of you for being here, and I'm listening with interest to your comments about uh, automobiles and uh, the engineers that are bringing those forward. As you know, in my district in Tennessee, the 7th District of Tennessee, we have a good bit of auto manufacturing, mm -hmm. uh, both within the district and on the fringes of the district, and I think that um, I've, I've done a little car shopping lately, and I've been amazed at how safe cars mm -hmm. have become and the safety features that are included in those cars. And I agree with both of you that I think that when our auto engineers in this country, who are the best in the world, put their mind to it, they will be able to solve some of these efficiency problems. But uh, Admiral Blair, as you were saying, the market needs to tell that. The American people need to say this is something that we are looking for and that we want. I remember uh, the gas crisis of uh, the 70s and what we went through there. I was a new mom with a, a, a new baby and I, I remember what we were uh, dealing with with those gas lines. So let me ask each of you, how do you think the American public would respond to rationing if we were to go through an oil crisis. We're looking at back the first of the year, we had 229 a gallon, and now the average uh, price in the country, I think, is at 301 this morning. We've watched a barrel of oil yeah. since the first of the year go from 55 to this morning. I think the Asian markets opened at 98 dollars a barrel. And so you're looking at a 75 percent increase in the cost of a barrel. You are looking at a 34 percent increase at the pump. So if we were to move to rationing, in your opinion, what, how do you think the American people would respond to that? And likewise, what do you think would happen with our domestic supplies if we only used our supplies and those of our close allies like Mexico and Canada, who are our two largest oil trading partners? Well, Go if ahead, you only used our supplies, Mexico and Canada, you would be in oil rationing. It wouldn't be a choice. You'd be right. there. And I mean, then how just would simply, the American people um, respond? I, I, I'll be honest think? with you. I don't, I don't yeah. think at this point in time particularly well. And I think that's because uh, while individual families and Americans, in my experience, are always prepared to do their part to solve a problem, uh, they want to know that the companies that make the product are also doing their part. And, and you know, I think there's a, a frustration that, that, that the American people have that they can't get more fuel efficient cars. Having said that, several manufacturers are now bringing to market the clean diesel engines, which can get in a, a mid to, I don't, know how, I don't know how you size cars, but in a sedan, I mean a sedan that seats comfortably four and, 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 and five people, you vehicle. can get 32 to 38 miles per gallon in a sedan in a clean, with a clean uh, diesel uh, fuel, and those are becoming more and more attractive to people. So when offered um, a more efficient car within a class, people are looking at them and are starting, you know, they're expensive right now, they will come down, they're only in certain high-end cars, uh, but I think Ford is going to bring one to market in the not-too-distant future. And so, you know, my experience is that as people become better educated, as there are more options, they will gravitate toward things that they think are good for their family, for their family's pocketbook, and for the environment of their community. Admiral Blair? Yeah, I think the American people would have two reactions in that scenario that you, that you sketch out. Number one, they'd be angry, frustrated, and looking for what got them into that fix. And number two, they'd roll up their sleeves and they'd do what had to be done to, to make it better, to work, to work their way out, out of it. But I guess my feeling is, uh, since we know that now, why don't we take the actions now to avoid that crisis? Because 
we know it'd be, uh, it'd be so much harder on us if we brought it to that point. I You're right, and changed habits is a big part of that, and looking at changed habits. Let me ask you uh, something in regard to that changing habits. You know, right now, uh, we do a lot of transport by truck across our nation's highways, and I was reading something the other day about the efficiencies of rail. Mm -hmm. uh, do you all see any, and I'm about out of time, but I'd love to hear what your thoughts are about moving more of our uh, movement of goods and commodities to rail and taking it off the highways. Any thoughts there? Um, I certainly think it's something that needs to be considered, and the, the rail industry has, has, has been out there promoting what they can do. One, one note I would just add to it is, you know, again, we're thinking here today about a, sort of a short-term oil shock, but we should always be thinking about what else could happen. And so, for example, a shift from one form of transportation to another, what does that do in terms of greenhouse gas emissions? What does that do in terms of conventional pollutants? And I'm not suggesting that rail creates a problem. I don't know the answer. It would be something worth understanding. But our, part of our proposals were that fuel efficiency standards should be applied to trucks as well as to cars and, and make the trucks that we have more efficient also by applying the same sort of technology to them as we do to to cars and raise the fuel efficiency standard of our truck fleet as well as our cars. And rail, do you see that as an option? I think then Viable? that the uh, I think then that the market would market would, would okay. make the right adjustments. Yeah. Uh, but I, I I think we should work on the, the truck sector as well. Thank you. I yield back. Right. General Lady's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this hearing. Thank you to our both of our. Uh, Excellent witnesses, and I did actually write that song in 1978 that started out, just give me the warm power of the sun, give me the restless power of the wind, et cetera. I, I also wish that we as a country had started doing those things, including conservation and all the renewables that were available then, uh, we would be in a much different position today. Uh, Admiral, you talked, Admiral, you talked about uh, uh, being jacked around by countries uh, that we used to have a freer hand to deal with and, uh, you know, it seems to me that our options diplomatically uh, or economically have been limited in terms of how we deal, for instance, with Saudi Arabia on one hand and China on the other hand. Is that what you would call a loss of sovereignty? Absolutely. The more you're, the more you're constrained because of your dependence on another country, the more sovereignty you've, uh, you've lost. Yeah. I mean, that just seems to me like we're going down a road that this country Residents of this country, citizens of the United States, have never understood what it's like to be in the position that Brazil was in in the 70s, for instance, where the, the world financial markets dictated to them certain things they had to do or else they wouldn't get their next round of debt floated. So uh, I think we need to be aware of that, that oil, our consumption of oil is putting us in that position. I think that's absolutely right. Some of that came up in these, um, in these uh, simulations when um, when the Secretary of State said in this simulation, well, I went to Country X and asked them if they would, if they would increase their amount of oil, and Country X said, yeah, I can do that, but there are a couple of things I want from you, United States, and uh, I want you to lay off hitting me on this policy that I'm doing. I want you to make this concession. So it puts us in a position of having to, to spend some of our blue chips to get some of theirs, and we just soon not be there. So, so my point is, I, I think you, you agree with me, and I'm agreeing with both of you here, is that, that what your simulation showed is, in fact, happening already tangibly, that we are uh, in a national security and sovereignty uh, emergency, that we're only recognizing, unfortunately, the public and, uh, the public and uh, you know, per perhaps our political leaders are, are only starting to get a handle on how fragile our situation is. Um, Admiral, you talked about oil being a fungible, fungible commodity. Would you agree that, to a large extent, conservation is also fungible, that saving energy anywhere frees up other energy somewhere else? I mean, understanding that liquid fuels are different than electricity, but to the extent that hybrids or plug-in hybrids or biofuels or, or conservation of any of the above will free up uh, more oil? It's not completely uh, completely fungible. Turn, turning down your thermostat doesn't, uh, doesn't mean you import less oil autom unless you're, automatically. Unless you're burning oil at home. To but that's a small and, and we're mainly concerned about, as I say, the oil, oil, uh, oil sector. But it's headed in the same direction. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, regarding but demand, uh, my colleague uh, 
from Tennessee who's uh, you know, talking about uh, demand, and I, you know, her point is good. I just wanted to add to that my observations from watching what little uh, hours of television I have time to watch, that the advertising, and I have some experience in the advertising industry as well, and I've had songs used for advertisements, and I always watch them with a, you know, that sort of professional eye. It seems to me that Detroit is advertising power and speed and style and not advertising efficiency. And uh, if you take notes, just make, make it a, uh, uh, a project one night to sit in front of the TV and every time a car ad comes on, make a note of what kind of car is being advertised and whether they're uh, touting efficiency and reliability or whether they're touting sexiness and speed and 340 horsepower to leap out of the stop sign or the, the, uh, the merge ramp. Um, I, I'm driving by choice, although I could have gone with an import and gotten 20 more miles per gallon. I'm driving a, a uh, on personal cars, a Detroit-made uh, union-built hybrid uh, full-time four-wheel drive SUV, which is rated at 33 miles per gallon and will get better than that if you drive it at 55 miles per gallon and stay in the right lane and let people whiz by you. And, and inflate your tires. And take and it easy going out from the stop, stop signs or stop lights. Yeah. If you step on it and drive angry, you're getting in the 20s. Yeah. So um, I just wanted to throw that in and say your uh, uh, suggestion of a possible uh, national speed limit again uh, is something that uh, I believe, you know, we should be considering, but it's going to take, basically what you're talking about is leadership. I mean, as I, as I hear it, that uh, everybody needs to feel that the sacrifice is shared, mm -hmm. and the only way that that's likely to happen is to have it come from uh, a strong statement of the leadership of our country that this is, we are now all approaching this together and uh, sharing the burden. I'm mm -hmm. sorry to talk so much and ask so few questions. My mm -hmm. time has expired. Mr. Chairman, I yield. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Larson. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I want to thank both the Admiral and uh, Ms. Browner for being here. And uh, let, me, let me go on record as saying that, uh, you know, I think that these scenarios can be very useful and instructive. And um, But I want to acknowledge right from the outset that because of his Martin Sheen-like qualities that I think Ed Markey should be cast as president of the United States, that uh, you know, it's a role befitting the chairman of the committee. Now, some may say that isn't that a patently suck-up move, and yes, it is, Ed. And so I hope that um, my legislation will be considered in order when the day arrives. But um, uh, Admiral, you mentioned something very uh, interesting in the scenarios as it was laid out and uh, as I understand it with the consequences confronting you with the potential shut off of supplies from Iran and uh, Venezuela. Here's my question. Uh, in a situation such as that, you said that uh, by virtue of the fact that we're dealing with unfriendly states that it almost becomes a de facto military situation. So the question is, in this scenario, where would the military deem to strike, if necessary, to recapture supplies? This hemisphere or in the Middle East? Uh, and then bringing it to reality, because I think that's what makes these useful, should Americans be concerned when we have yet another battle group doing maneuvers in the Persian Gulf. I think the, the connection between uh, military force and oil supplies is a little more subtle than that. We don't, we don't go in and take, take over oil fields and sort of run them with, run them with soldiers and, and contractors. That's not really the, that's not really the uh, point. I don't think we invaded Iraq to get their oil. But uh, what I'm saying is the fact that that region supplies a commodity which is so fundamentally important to the United States means that the United States is ineluctably involved in the affairs of that, uh, of that region and will uh, have to have a much deeper in, in involvement in them and that, so that when one state threatens another or invades another as Iraq invaded Kuwait back in 19, 1991, 
a, an issue in which military force clearly has an application, we'll do, we'll, we'll do it. We'll, we'll, we'll use military force there. The military, for, the military uh, situations that, uh, that clearly call for a military response in that part of the word, world are threatened and closing the Straits of Hormuz, the, the scenario that we had in the tanker wars in the mid-1980s when both Iraq and Iran were attacking attacking oil tankers and we ended up um, uh, reflagging and, and, and escorting, escorting them. So it's, it's, it's not so much that militarily we go in and take over oil fields, which is, uh, which is uh, not, not a very useful alternative. It's that we are, we're in the region and when military force is, is, is used, the United States has got to consider what we do with our forces and we kind of get sucked into it the way we, we have over 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 time, uh, what what I think is 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 going on here is that as if the United States has a very um, great vulnerability to short-term interruptions, and countries like Venezuela and Iran, who are no friends of this this country, can sort of throttle back for a while, doesn't hurt them really really badly, hurt hurts us. It gives them advantages across the board in dealing with their interests as opposed to ours, which are uh, which which which. So these maneuvers in the, in the Persian Gulf should be viewed as saber rattling uh, to assist diplomacy or well, are they concerns that uh, <laughs> members of Congress in any scenario should be um, very much aware of? Yeah, and it's last night I took the uniform off five years ago. <laughs> it wasn't my area and, and um, we've, got good, we've got good people who, who took our places there and uh, I think you need to talk to them. And you said you weren't a good politician. <laughs> <laughs> if, I, if I might just note, in this scenario, um, one of the things that did unfold uh, from, I think it was the uh, Secretary of, of Defense, was a uh, question for the President, should we change the Selective Service Registration requirements to capture women? Um, and secondly, uh, should we begin thinking about some form of a draft because the concern in the scenario that he was bringing to the table is that the military is stretched very, very thin. Um, I might also note that in the scenario, the president is not in the room. There's sort of an Oz-esque figure behind a, a curtain, so Mr. Markey would have to uh, uh, peek in occasionally. Uh, but you, you would be a great Secretary of Treasury. Well, I, I was thinking <laughs> of letting him, um, Mr. Lassen be vice president, so then it could reflect the real power in the United States anyway, you know, and so <laughs> then I would be. <laughs> <laughs> the gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes himself for a round of questions. And under your scenario, only 1% of the world's oil supply is taken off the market. It leads to $160. Uh, ba a barrel oil. It leads to a collapse of the economy. What is it that has led to having the oil markets become so tight that they can have such a profound impact in such a short period of time? Well, I think it, it, in the scenario it's a combination of, of factors, um, but certainly the failure of efficiency, the failure to drive down the amount of oil we use uh, on a daily basis uh, becomes pretty important because while it, it's, it's the actual number is, what it ends up at about a, a billion barrels a day. Um, that's not, yeah. yeah, that's not a, an amount that can't be addressed through some prudent steps taken, you know, sooner rather than later. For that, uh, that I agree with you, uh, Mr. Chairman, that was sort of a surprising, um, surprising uh, effect. You'd think on a percentage basis it wouldn't be that big. The, the, um, the game play for that result was, uh, was done by a uh, energy, uh, highly respected uh, Canadian energy consulting company that we fed the information to and then asked them, okay, what did that do to uh, price of barrels? And they, they ran their quantitative models and their judgment and, and what I think was at play there was that with the oil market so tight in the future, primarily because of the increases in non-U.S. production, India and China are leading it. You find that non-U.S. oil demand goes up 30, 38 percent over maybe the next five years, whereas U.S. demand goes up about 24 percent. That's just making the oil market so, so tight 
that the power of expectations come, comes to play, and even relatively small tremors make people worry about the future, therefore want to uh, ensure their own supplies, they bid up prices, and so you're just in this uh, trigger in which uh, a, a, a relatively small rock in the pond has pretty big ripples. Now, so you, you talk in your testimony, Admiral, about our ever-growing military presence uh, in the Middle East. Um, could you give us some sense of how you feel, for example, that this growing dependence upon oil affects our relationship with Saudi Arabia? I think it gives this Saudi, Saudi Arabia uh, much greater leverage in its dealings with, uh, with us, and it's no secret that, uh, that there are uh, a lot of uh, aspects of Saudi Arabia in the future that we have real, real, concern, real concerns about, and when you are that much, um, when, you, when a country with that sort of uh, challenges has that much, uh, much of a thumb on you, you it, it, causes, it causes concern. So it's not a whole lot more complicated than that, uh, Mr. Chairman. So the, 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 the language that you each made reference to, the 35 miles per gallon by 2020, actually backs out the equivalent of all of the oil that we import from the Persian Gulf um, on a daily basis uh, by 2020. How important is that, Admiral? I, I think that would, just, that would just put us in a lot better position to be able to deal in a more balanced manner with, uh, with, uh, with Saudi Arabia. I think it would, it would have um, made the position of those people in the shockwave uh, much, much, e much easier. Okay. Uh, Ms. Browna, can you uh, talk to this issue of of the 35 mile per gallon standard by 2020 and how important you think it is for the Congress to pass that this year? It, it's absolutely essential. We have got to get on with, with doing this. And as I said in my opening statement, this is the second time I've participated in one of these. Um, the last was several years ago. The message from both of them was identical, that taking steps sooner rather than later is, is key to these problems. In the case of CAFE and, and the proposal that the Senate has passed, it would have solved the problem that we were confronting. And you know, it wasn't as if this scenario was designed to then conclude with you should have passed CAFE. It is just the fact that when you go back and look at how it unfolded, that's one of the easiest ways, actually, to have solved the problem. And, and Admiral, are you convinced that we can improve the efficiency without compromising the safety of American people in terms of the vehicles which they drive? Yes, sir, I, I am. The, 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 I'd say the strongest technical support for that judgment was uh, our updating of a study done back in 2002 by the, uh, by the National Academy of Sciences, which looked at existing, and, and we, the, Ener <coughs> the Securing America's Ener Future Energy uh, Project, asked the authors of that to update it to about 2000, 2005. Are there available technologies which can influence which can improve efficiency without sacrificing uh, s safety. And the answer from these technical experts was unambiguously uh, yes, uh, it, it, uh, it could. And that was even without considering hybrids and some other more recent uh, te technologies. So I think the, the technical answer is uh, yes, it can be, it, it can be done and it, and it should be done. Another part of our proposal was that what if we're wrong? What if, what if uh, this is? Uh, resulting in unsafe vehicles, and we and we provided uh, in our in our recommendations that the National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration have the authority to be able to waive waive standards based on sound technical arguments uh, having to do with safety and and with uh, and with with economy. But we think the burden of proof ought to be put on 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 people saying why they can't do it rather than. Why they, why they can, which is sort of where it is now, which you hear from the auto companies, you know, American consumers don't want it, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. So we think we ought to shift the burden the other direction. Okay. Um, uh, Ms. Browner? Well, um, you know, at EPA, I obviously got the chance to regulate the automotive industry, and they always said no, 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 and then they always turned around and did it. And I think, you know, Mr. Chairman, your leadership on CAFE and your proposal on CAFE, the Senate proposal, I, there is no doubt in my mind that they can do it. They will complain loudly. Uh, but they will end up being able to do it. So my time has expired. L let's do this. Let's, let's, we, I apologize to you. Uh, President Sarkozy of France is uh. about to address the House, and that's why the members have been leaving, because um, 
uh, he is going to come out onto the House floor in the next 15 to 20 minutes. So the members have been leaving for that purpose, and we had to move the hearing up in order to accommodate that as well. Um, so what I'd like from each of you, if, if you could give us your takeaway message, what it is that you want us to uh, remember uh, over this next four weeks especially as we mm -hmm. consider this energy bill, which is pending before the House and Senate, um, as we have this opportunity to, to pass the, the largest and most important energy bill in the last 30 years uh, in the United States Congress, um, as the world convenes in Bali uh, in one month uh, to talk about the relationship between energy and climate, as Al Gore goes to Oslo to receive the Nobel Peace, Peace Prize, the, the world speaking to the United States in a lot of ways through that prize. Uh, could you each give us your, your takeaway message for the Congress as we reach this final four weeks? Admiral Blair. Yes, sir. My takeaway message would be pass this bill with conservation members, pop your champagne, but please don't stop there. Go on to the other aspects of a comprehensive solution having to do with, having to do with supply, having to do with all alternatives, and keep on steady pressure uh, to have a comprehensive uh, strategy. But but nail down that first step, which is passing this bill, which the Senate has passed. Um, please, uh, I, I, I ask you to please pass a bill. You know, this is a great, important moment, I think, in our history, and, and I agree with the Admiral. It's, it's, it's a first step. There will be other steps we need to take, but it is an absolutely essential step. We need to get started. We need to get started on more fuel-efficient cars. We need to get started on renewable electricity standards. And, Mr. Chairman, the leadership that you and, and the members of this committee have, have brought to this debate is, is, is remarkable, and I, I feel like we're, we're just sort of sitting on the edge of something really great beginning. Um, there will be a lot more to do. Obviously, greenhouse gas emissions, carbon are going to be important. But if we could get this done, if we could say to the American people, you know, our leaders want to do something, they want to work with you for a better future, it would be wonderful. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Um, this issue really is, um, uh, is reaching the point of, um, uh, of decision. Uh, Speaker Pelosi in January of this year created this Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming as her only Select Committee during the two years uh, that she will be in her first term as Speaker. So clearly um, this is something that's very important to her. Uh, it's now as a day, as each day goes by, becoming increasingly important to the American economy as well, in addition to the security of our country and uh, the climate. Uh, on Monday of this week, uh, we had 5,500 young people, mm -hmm. young leaders from across the country come uh, to Washington, mm -hmm. presidents of their senior class, the head of their environmental movements on campus. Uh, we had that hearing in the Ways and Means the main committee room, 700 young people uh, packing that room with thousands of others surrounding uh, the Longworth building as they were testifying about the responsibility that this generation has to their generation, the green generation. Uh, uh, to solve this problem, to play our part in passing this first step, uh, in beginning the process of reversing this dependence upon uh, imported oil and fossil fuels. Uh, we thank you both for your leadership on this issue. Uh, with that, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you.